I choose to start by uh, a question that was addressed in the London 2016 conference of geoethics by a journalist who said, oh, you skeptic, could you find an example in history uh, of uh, such uh, uh, a big mistake, a big theory uh, believed by a lot of people, of a lot of scientists, and uh, that turned to be wrong? And that was a, indeed a good question. And uh, this kind of question, scientists in general are um, not... Uh, it's, it's difficult sometimes to sign, for scientists to answer that because uh, a lot of scientists does not have a historical perspective on their own domain. It is not uh, teached. When you learn science, you seldom have uh, lessons about history of sciences or one hour sometime, but not, not the, that much, at least uh, for what I know. And second, is that even if, if I, even when the history of sciences is, is teach, it is teach as a way to success. For the classical example is history of mechanics. So in general, you start with uh, Aristotle, that is uh, well, the nice guy, but who did not not, not uh, know very much. And then came Galileo uh, on the principle of inertia, that's very good. And then you have even more with the Newton and the uh, uh, universal gravitation theory. And then ultimately you get uh, Einstein and then we saw the light. And we don't teach many scientific mistakes. And we do not see easily that in fact science is not only a road to, to progress, but there are also a lot of error, of uh, historical errors. So uh, when I prepared this, this talk, I, I, was, uh, I, was, I first imagined that I would list a lot of mistakes, uh, historical mistakes, but in fact uh, I found too many. Uh, there are a lot of them. And that's interesting because, well, if you take some of them, each uh, it, it, it provides an um, uh, interesting point of view to understand what's going on with climate. Uh, I mean that even if climate, the, the, the climate story is especially big, and especially difficult to understand. Uh, still, we have in history several other examples that each uh, provide intellectual tools to understand what what's going on uh, nowadays. And uh, well, for example, uh, you can you can read a wonderful conference made by uh, Irving Longmuir in 1953, I guess, which is uh, called Patholo Pathological Science. You can write it and see it, it is on the internet and we'll, you'll get many interesting histories about the, the Allison effects, the n rays, the mitogenic effects and well, many experiments made by real physicists in the 20th century that uh, provided uh, many, many publications in peer-reviewed uh, paper, um, uh, scientific uh, uh, reviews and some of, for some of them hundreds of papers about an effect that eventually proves not to exist. And uh, um, another example is uh, as a mathematician, uh, I'm a specialist of uh, what we call the linear recurrence sequences. Well, this is the basic tool of uh, what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm studying as a searcher. And uh, well, the example was given this morning about the Fibonacci sequence, which is the most simple linear recurrent sequence. And I was very surprised when, for uh, work uh, in the history of sciences, to discover that the first real algebraic uh, study of such a, such a mathematical tool was done by Leonard Euler. So this is not a surprise because Euler is a, is a great mathematician, maybe the, mo the most brilliant mathematician in history. But Euler studied these sequences to answer a question asked by Susmilch, who was a friend of him, a theologist, and it was intended to study the number of people living before the flood, the Biblic flood. <laughs> we are in the middle of the 18th century. Oh, that's strange. Uh, I, I will not develop this, because that would be interesting, but it's too long. It, each, each error is interesting in itself. So, uh, eventually, I choose to, to, to take only one of them. Uh, I chose, uh, I chose the example because it is probably the closest and the, the biggest uh, I, I can found and the, 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 the closest to the global warming uh, affair and we, you probably already know uh, at least the name of it, it is the Lysenko affair. So uh, 
you'll make all the parallels that you want between the Lysenko affair and the, and the, and the global warming uh, affair. But uh, what I would like to, to, to say when talking about the Lysenko affair is that it is not simply about, it, it, it is a complex history. In general, uh, when we talk about Lysenko, we, we, we think about uh, um, an agronomer, agronomist? An agronomist? Uh, who was a an agronomer, okay, agronomer, sorry. Uh, who was a friend of Stalin and a kind of maverick of science and since Stalin was an autocratic man he, he decided to put his friend on the top of the, uh, of the science of its, of its time and it was a disaster so this is generally presented as simply a story of, um, of, of a bad effect of totalitarianism but in fact it is also a bad effect of the link between science and politics or ideology and that was uh, the, the beginning of the of our conference uh, Christopher Essex said well I tried to separate science and politics and it's perfectly right on this issue and the the Lysenko affair proved that it's, it's still we, indeed we have really to, to be very careful when trying to mix science and ideology or simply not not always ideology but just point, uh, point of view on the world our, our way, the way we have to see the world, all the, the good, all the bad, etc. We have to separate this. And to, uh, so the Lysenko affair um, started, in fact, well, to, to understand what happened, we have to start in the uh, 19th century. In the 19th century, because we have to understand a little bit of um, Marxism theory and Marxism philosophy. And there are uh, two, two important things that, that are important in Marxist philosophy for understanding the Lysenko affair. The first one is historical materialism. Historical materialism in, uh, for, for Karl Marx was uh, the, a way to understand how uh, history uh, evolved. And it's, uh, it's in, it's seen that I would, I would go very fast, of course. It's, it's quite subtle and interesting, but for the purpose of the, of the talk, I will go very fast. It's a walk toward progress, and the main idea is that uh, the, the, the progress is, is fueled by the increase of the mean of the, the capacity of production. And there is a, well, a dominant class who possesses the, 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 mean, of, um, the well, mean of production, the well, production tools, and the working class which is uh, dominated by, uh, by the other one. And the more the capacities of production grow, the more the working class uh, is, uh, well, is a, the better it is. And history is, in, in, in Marx's view, the, the, the long history of the, the growing of the, of, the, of the working class. And eventually, the last, uh, the last battle, the last revolution, will uh, make the, the working class uh, take the power. And there, then there will be no uh, class struggle anymore, since there will be only one class, which, uh, which is the working class, the proletarians. So in this view, the, the, the uh, science is a, a tool of domination. So the, the dominant class, the bourgeoisie, at the time of Karl Marx, uh, as he put it, the bourgeoisie used the science as an efficient tool to, 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 to remain dominant against the working class. And then uh, the, another aspect of Marxism philosophy is a dialect, dialectical materialism. And dialectical materialism it takes its origin in Hegel, and uh, in the beginning it's a methodology for uh, the description of the dynamics in the world. The idea is uh, dynamics in the world is described by action of antagonistic forces. So, uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, if you want, to put it very simply. And class struggle is this kind of, uh, is this kind of, of way to put the... To, 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 well, to, to, to apply, in some sense, the, the dialectical materialism. And uh, dialectical materialism is possibly, you can use it as simply a methodology to understand the world. Thesis and thesis and synthesis was used by Eagle. It was not especially uh, uh, more than a, a tool for philosopher or, or, or thinker. But you can also say, and that will be, for example, the, uh, Stalin's position, that uh, it is indeed a law of the universe. 
not only methodology but a law of the universe. And if you see things in this way, then uh, you have to, well, science becomes something totally different. Science, particular science, chemistry, biology, or so on, so on, just become uh, well, uh, just have to to reflect this fundamental law. And then you have to understand science by the way of um, uh, dialectical materialism. So this is the, the intellectual framework in which we are in the Soviet Union in the 20th century, with also many variations, many evolutions. It's a, it's a very, very rude presentation here, very crude. Then enters the Senko. And uh, almost all what I know about the Senko, I know it by a book written by a French philosopher named Dominique Lecourt, who wrote a book uh, written uh, uh, entitled Lysenko. And what's interesting in Dominique Lecour is that uh, when he wrote the book in 1974, he was a, a Marxist philosopher, so he knew exactly what he was talking about, and uh, it was interesting. So uh, Lysenko was an agronomer and biologist who, uh, okay, in, uh, in the 20s, get some successes uh, with uh, some practical uh, ideas to improve uh, uh, harvest. And um, it was purely technical. He was not a theoretician. He was just a, a, oh, I have this idea, it is called nowadays vernalization. Uh, to, to, to put it in a few words, it was about temperature of seas and uh, about some ideas like that. But it was still interesting and he started an interesting career, but as a technician. And in the 30s, he decided to set up a theory that uh, would um, help him to understand what was going on in his, uh, in his uh, ideas. And that was okay, but uh, what he did not do, what he, was that Feynman joins us to do, uh, on the, we heard about that yesterday in, in a talk, is that when you have a theory, you, you, you make a guess, then you have to uh, uh, find the consequence of your guess and then test it by an experiment. And uh, Lysenko did not do, do that. He set up a theory and then he stick to the theory and did not try really to, to apply it, to, to see whether it was uh, working indeed. And uh, his theory about uh, well, agronomy was a kind of Lamarckism, that is, he, he believed in the possibility of um, inheritance of uh, acquired characteristics. And this was uh, very interesting in, in regards to Marxism, because if you, well, you can put it in the historical, diet, uh, historical materialism quite easily. It can be uh, understood as a, indeed as a, as a consequence, as, a, as an application to biology of historical materialism. Because, well, if you can inherit the uh, acquired characteristics, that means that the environment uh, has a, a deep effect on the individuals. And this is what happens when the working class improves its condition because of uh, the capacity of production. And uh, then in the 40s, uh, Lysenko triumphed, it was his big success, especially in uh, 84 with a debate organized in the, in the Soviet Academy of, uh, of Agricultural Science where he beat all his enemies. And, uh, it, but he succeeded especially because his views were uh, closely tied to Marxism. For example, and there are many examples for, for that, but I, I will mention only one, uh, his view uh, about uh, Darwin. He says uh, he's a Darwinist, he, even if in fact it's not really Darwinism, but still he says, I like Darwin, but he says there are two Darwins. First Darwin is uh, the Darwin, uh, the good Darwin, uh, that talk about uh, the survival of the fittest. This is good because this is progress. Uh, you can fit this into the, uh, the historical uh, materialism. And the bad Darwin is the struggle for life. Because the idea of struggle for life is a way, for, is, is, a, is an argument for the bourgeoisie to maintain and to justify its domination over the working class. And what Lysenko said on other people around him was that 
In fact, if you, if you believe that uh, 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 dialectical materialism is indeed a law of the universe, then you don't have, as Marx said, one science which is kept by the bourgeoisie to dominate. You have two sciences. Because either a science, a particular science, either reflects the dialectical materialism, even if the vocabulary is not good because scientists didn't know, were not aware of the light of the dialectical materialism. Sometimes you can just rephrase what is written and that's okay. But also there, is, there are sciences that, that are not, uh, that, that cannot fit the, uh, dialect, uh, the dialectical materialism. So these sciences are wrong sciences. These are bourgeois, science for the bourgeoisie, and not true science. And necessarily, the good science is, is the science, is a proletarian science. And he, he indeed talked about proletarian science. Why is, it, why is it necessarily better than the other one? It's because uh, the bourgeoisie science is, uh, is only intended to maintain the power of the domain class. And the, the, the proletarian science is intended to, uh, to use the truth to get more power. So it is different uh, natures of, of science. So, I know that this is still the end, so I will just a few words about the end of the story. The end of the story was in the 50s. Um, in, uh, for uh, several reasons, but the, the main reason was that uh, in the beginning of the 50s, the efficiency of uh, Senkoism was clear. It was a complete failure, a uh, really dramatic failure. It was implemented and it was a failure. But still, even after the death of Stalin, one year after, uh, Lysenko remains in office. And uh, it's, it's, so this proves that uh, it was not only a, friend, a story of friendship between Stalin and Lysenko, there is uh, something else. And to understand why, it's, that it's precisely that Lysenko indeed uh, was able to link the fundamental philosophy of Soviet regime with his, uh, with his own uh, uh, biology theory. So it was not easy to get rid of it. So eventually it seems that, uh, well, possibly Khrushchev uh, called him and said, uh, hey, how are you, Senko? I have good news for you. I've got a new job for you. Now you could help us de-Lysenkoize Soviet agriculture. And Senko said, yes. And he did that and it was there. Of course, in, the, uh, in a smooth way, but it was uh, the, uh, the way it did. And to end just a second, because I think it's important, what I've just done is a, is a kind of perspective. Maybe you, see, you, you will say that, uh, well, we could hope that uh, someday a uh, high, uh, high uh, policymaker will uh, tell the top IPCC leaders, hey, we have a new job for you, and maybe that would be end, the end of the climate fear. But that would be a perspective, an analogy, and uh, I don't want uh, this to be done. We have here a tool to understand some things, but it is not a prospective tool. It's nothing more than a descriptive tool, and we have to be very careful of it. And to illustrate this, I will just quote, and that will be the, my last word, uh, a French, uh, French writer, which is Paul Valéry, who wrote in the, in the middle of the last century a wonderful book in which it is written this, History is the most dangerous product that the chemistry of the intellect has ever conceived. History justifies whatever we want. It teaches absolutely nothing because it contains everything. How many books were written entitled The Lessons of This or The Teaching of That? Nothing more ridiculous to read after the events that followed the events that this, those books interpreted in the direction of the future. Thank you for that.